Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Howard Jenfi, and I'm a customer success scientist here at Nicoya. Today, I'm bringing you a, a webinar entitled Troubleshooting Your Open SPR Experimental Data Part 2. Before I begin, I would like to say thank you for making time for this uh, webinar. And uh, let's get rolling. So as I mentioned, it's a follow up to webinar number uh, four. We are going to take a look at the NTA sensor chemistry and treat it similar to how we treated the carboxyl sensor in the previous webinar. So the format of my presentation is going to start by giving you a brief preview of what we discussed last time and then we will dive into um, the NTA sensor chemistry. So let's get started. As I mentioned, my topic for discussion today is troubleshooting your NTA uh, your experimental data and the focus is on the NTA sensor. So previously in number four, webinar number four, we discussed how to understand unusual sensograms. And the unusual sensograms were discussed under four different artifacts, non-specific binding bulk shift and then air spikes. After we were able to identify these kind of uh, artifacts, we discussed how to overcome it. And how did we discuss, uh, how did we overcome it? We used sample properties, buffer component, and then the experimental setup itself. Remember, we talk about referencing, and then we also talk about some maintenance tips. Since most of this talk was, uh, this talk was based on the carboxyl sensor, we listened to some of the feedback that you, we received after the presentation, and we decided to take a look at another chemistry, which is the NTA sensor chemistry. Hence my outline for today's talk. So today, as I mentioned, we are going to overview the NTA sensor surface. We are going to look at the molecule that is on the sensor, and then what are the required reagents if we decide to go by the NTA approach what do we need? And then some of the advantage of using these sensors. After we have looked at the, uh, it in general, we will then move on to how to set up your experiment, how to actually get to use this. We, I know most of you are familiar with it, but I'm going to give you a few tips to consider to be successful in setting up your, uh, your experiment on the NTA sensor. And then finally, we will talk about how to troubleshoot the artifact. And again, I'm going to follow the same pattern, non-specific binding bulk shift and then air spikes. Notice that most of my talk, I will make, I'll be making reference to webinar number four because some of these uh, items have been discussed in the past and it can be applied to different chemistries. So that brings me to the start of my talk. What is NTA uh, census? NTA sensor, as we all know, they are nitrilotriacetic acid functionalized on, on the sensor surface. These uh, functionalities will be used to couple to polyhistidine tag from an incoming ligand. And the condition is that there has to be a nickel. And what does the nickel do? Here we show that you have a layer of NTA on the sensor surface and it's activated by a nickel group that is coming in. The second step will be to immobilize your ligand, and the ligand will be attached to the surface, provided everything is successful. And the ligand is stabilized on the surface by this coordination complex. We see that there is an octahedral coordination complex whereby the polyhistidine tag from the ligand is bidentate, it occupying two sites on the nickel, and four sites are, of course, occupied by the nitrilo acidic, uh, the acidic acid moieties. So now we know that this is the center, the nickel is very important because without it, we don't have any complex. What else? Uh, why do we care about this um, chemistry? We know that, as I showed in the previous uh, figure, 
the hexahistidine tag ligand is stabilized by capture coupling, unlike covalent coupling that we saw in, in the case of uh, the carboxyl senses. Some of you may argue that these cap uh, capture co couplings are not very stable. Yes, we know that the carboxyl senses, whenever the ligand is uh, coupled to the surface, it's like it's glued, it's irreversible. You cannot like take it back. However, in this case, there's a lot of flexibility in that the ligand can be dissociated from the surface. So some people get worried about the ligand uh, leaching from the surface during the course of the reaction. And then I present to you this point to say that if you have a hexahistidine tag, which ranges from somewhere from 6 to 10, or let's say 5 to 10 polyhistidine molecules, you would see a very tight association between the NTA on the sensor surface and the ligand. Research has even shown that polyhistidine tag of just three histidines are also very stable. But then we would uh, suggest that it's good to have enough polyhistidines in your sequence. So six to 10 will be a good number, or five to 10 is also okay. And then, like I mentioned, these, because they are captured, the polyhistidine ligand could be removed from the surface and then re-immobilized. So let's say even if during the course of your reaction somehow, the intensity of the, uh, the immobilization, the ligand keep decreasing. Like you see that the ligand in, is actually getting off the sensor surface. What you could do is that you could strip the entire surface and then re-immobilize your ligand. And even sometimes if you decide that you are, you are, you are done studying uh, the um, kinetics between that particular ligand, you could also use an entirely different ligand. And the research in our lab has shown that you could do this stripping and re-immobilization over uh, like 10 times. So now that we know that they are very versatile, let's look up at another importance. They, whenever you have the ligand immobilized on the surface, let me show you this figure, which um, simplifies it. We know that these polyhistidine tags are usually localized on the C-terminal or the N-terminal of the protein molecules. So it means that if they are immobilized on the surface, there is like real, really neat directionality in that only where the hexahistidine tag is located get attached to the sensor surface. So assuming this is a perfect scenario where you have all the active sites of your ligand pointing in one direction. Let's look at the carboxyl sensor on the right. Since it relies on primary amine, and we know that <laughs> all the amino acids would have primary amine, of course. So it means that they all have propensity to bind to these uh, sensor surfaces, provided they are exposed. So it means that maybe you have your sensor surface one exposed amino acid would actually couple to the sensor surface. One protein ligand will couple in the X direction, Y direction, or the Z direction, as I've simplified here. So you see that unlike here where we have everything pointing in one direction, you could have situation like this, and this could also go all the way to the left. This is not to say that the, uh, the NTA sensors are better than the carboxyl sensor. We all know that the carboxyl sensors are very versatile. You All you need is a ligand that has a primary amine. And when that ligand goes on there, you know that you don't have to actually strip it because it won't strip. It's kind of like uh, irreversible. And then you have it there for good. So both of these chemistries have their own strengths and weaknesses. And it's dependent on what you have in your lab that you would choose which chemistry to go for. So how do we get success with these uh, sensors? The NTA chip, we know that it has uh, NTA functionalities on the surface. And to be able to bring in an incoming histag ligand, you need nickel. So first of all, you need a histag ligand and then nickel. Another thing that one has to pay attention to is the pH. The localization of the ligand on the surface of the chip is favorable at slightly basic pHs. And also, buffer component could also affect this uh, localization. We will look at all of these into details pretty soon. So let's start with nickel, because we know that before you even purchase this NTA sensor, you have a, a polyhistidine tag uh, protein in your lab. So the next item we should look at is nickel. And the nickel, we saw that it was like the, the glue that stabilizes 
this uh, complex. So nickel is sitting here in this octahedral uh, 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 complex, and then is coupled by the NTA groups here. And then on the bottom, we will see the uh, polyhistine intact. So what happens is that when th this nickel is removed by something, then everything falls apart. So in order for us to have um, our ligand immobilized on the surface throughout the course of the reaction, we need to make sure that there isn't anything that is taking away this nickel from um, the sensor surface. Now that we know how nickel is important, let's look at the next item, which is pH. What role does pH play? I mentioned that this uh, um, ligand immobilization is favorable at slightly basic pHs. And uh, like we, we, we saw last time, pH would also detect the, the charges the biomolecules would have in solution. And remember, we are looking at immobilizing a polyhistidine tag here. So what happens is that if you have an acidic pH, say, let's say you have a pH of 4, you don't know that, let's assume that you got these senses, you, you don't really know what pH to work with. And then we decided that we are going to work, uh, do the mobilization at pH 4. At pH 4, what is seen is that the delta protons that is highlighted in this box is on the polyhistidine tags. So this is like the proton on event. But then at pH 8, because it's basic, what happens is that the proton is abstracted from that nitrogen. And this is the form that is able to couple to the nickel to form that coordination complex. We see here that at pH 4, when there is a hydrogen blocking uh, the proton, uh, sorry, the lone pair of electron is not sitting there, there wouldn't be any complex forming. So we, from here, we could say that, yeah, indeed, pH is very important. You would want to work at a slightly basic pH whereby you have um, these lone pair of electrons on uh, the nitrogen in the hexahisidine tag. Now that we know that um, pH also helps in stabilization our ligand, let's look at the third or the fourth item or the other things that we should actually avoid. We know that we definitely need a hexahistidine tag. We need nickel to stabilize the complex, and we need a slightly basic uh, pH to actually also stabilize the complex. What don't we need is what we are looking at now. So here, we see that, of course, it's obvious that any condition that is going to take away these parameters that stabilize the complex should be avoided. So nickel is important because it's the one that holds the complex together. So anything that is going to be in solution that will chelate the nickel ions would cause the ligand to fall off the surface, would destabilize it. Also, another thing is the buffer component. And I give examples here, which is the EDTA. We know that EDTA would, is a divalent ion chelator. So whatever is in solution is going to suck up the nickel ions and decrease the concentration. And then we have lower chances of stabilizing our ligand on the surface. As we show here, we see that EDTA has all these COO minus groups, which are able to have affinity for the nickel ions in solution. So we need to um, avoid conditions that has EDTA when we are dealing with um, these NTA sensors. Another thing that we'd want to look at is other buffer molecules that has polyhistidine-like structures, like imidazole. If you have imidazole at pH 8, we see that we have the same lone pair, the, the delta proton have been um, abstracted here. It's not very different from here. So if you were um, the NTA groups on the surface, what one would prefer is to go for this because even the steric that comes with this chain is not there. So this would be able to outcompete the hexahistidine or whatever length of the hexahistidine tag that one has in solution and prevent the ligand from immobilizing onto the surface. So we must avoid all conditions such that will have a lot of imidazole in our buffer system. Also, 
we would want to avoid excessive amount of our ligand. And this is where the confusion starts. We say that we need a lot of ligand to get a lot of signal on the surface. Remember that I mentioned that while this is good, we need to get a lot of signal for our kinetics. We could also run into steric hindrance. And the, in this case, it becomes very important because we know that the complex relies on the identity coordination of histidine molecules per every ligand molecule. So if you have so many of these uh, polyhistidine tag in solution, the chances of each polyhistidine tag forming this bidentate coordination will be decreased. And when it decreases, you have low chances of stabilizing your ligand. So not only would it have steric crowding as we, we, we studied, we just spoke about, it also would prevent the ligand from being immobilized onto the surface. So from here, the take home message is that a moderate amount of ligand would be very useful. So in all, I would like to say that, yeah, the histag ligand is required for NTA chemistry, of course. And then one could experience some problems with this chemistry, just like any other chemistry that we decide to go with. But then we have discussed how to overcome it by avoiding conditions such as divalent ion chelated, which is EDTA that I've listed here, high imidazole concentration, and acidic pH. These are conditions that we want to avoid in order to have our ligand stabilized on the surface. But if you want to remove your ligand, these are the same conditions that you would use. You choose any of these and you will be able to strip the ligand from the surface. Okay, so here we also know that the same condition should be avoided if you want the ligand to be stable, but if you want to strip the ligand and maybe put a new ligand or put the instrument in standby mode or something and come back to use your chip again, you will go for these uh, uh, conditions. So then that brings me to the second part of my presentation. So now we assume that everything has gone well. We have successfully immobilized our ligand. What are the other problems that we could see? The next step will be the analyte injection. The analyte injection, of course, let's have some fun here. Let, so let's say you have your ligand successfully immobilized onto the surface as seen here. And Mr. Smiley Face here is your analyte. If everything goes on well, Mr. Smiley Face finds all the desirable binding site and bind onto it, which is very nice. However, sometimes, Mr. Smiley Face finds itself on top of the sensor surface. Oh no, we have NSB happening. And what on earth is NSB? Like I mentioned, I'm revisiting this slide from our previous slide. NSB is a binding of analyte molecule to undesirable sensor surfaces, like we see here. We expect that these analyte molecules should actually bind to the, this active site, but then it finds itself onto the sensor surface. Why do we have to control this? Because it leads to increase in mass on the sensor surface as we see here. And this mass actually lead to false um, positive responses. And these positive responses could actually affect your KA. It's gonna either decrease your KA or increase your equilibrium dissociation constant. For more details about this, please visit uh, webinar number four, where I take my time to go slide by slide and then talk about this effect. So how now that we know how N N NSB look like, how do we actually pick it up in our sensorgram? How do we identify it? Again, going back to a previous slide that I, we talked about in webinar number four, it will depend on the kind of instrument that you are using. Nicoya has two kind of open SPR systems. We have the one channel system and the two channel system. The image on this uh, figure is coming from a two channel system. As the name implies, the two channel system would have two channels. Channel one is solely dedicated for um, detecting these non-specific binding, which is called also the reference channel here in red. And the channel two is where we immobilize our ligand. That's where the specific binding is monitored. The overall um, 
response is actually the teal line here, which is when channel one has been subtracted from channel two. In this case, we find out that there is basically no response because of the magnitude of the non-specific binding. If you see something like this and you're lucky enough to have a two-channel system, then you know that no, you cannot proceed. You need to do um, perform some optimization to be able to reduce um, the intensity of the red curve. However, if you have a one-channel system, you, you don't have these two different channels. It means that you would have to separately perform um, a non-specific binding test and then come back to do your experiment. Again, you could visit webinar number four for more details on how to set up a non-specific binding test on a one-channel system. Okay, so then how do we overcome this non-specific binding in, on an NTA sensor? So now, from here onwards, most of the presentation is going to look very similar to what we discussed in webinar number four. So looking at how to uh, overcome NT, um, this NSB on the NTA sensor, we know that most of the non-specific binding in a two-channel system is observed in a one-channel system. In our protocols, we say that the ligand only gets immobilized into channel two. So after the ligand immobilization step, when you have introduced your polyhistidine tag ligand, you have a system whereby on the sensor surface, there is a channel two that has one layer of thickness than the channel one because channel one doesn't have any ligand because the nickel solution goes into both channel one and two. But the polyhistidine tag ligand goes into only channel two. So it means that in channel two, channel one, you would have activated NTA nickel groups that are still sitting there. And these surfaces are very sticky. They would bind to some of the molecules of your analyte. So in order to prevent these binding, you have to immobilize a different protein into this second um, channel, sorry, this channel one. And that would actually reduce NSV, as I would show you very soon. So if you do that, like in our case, for this particular uh, example that I'm going to show you, we had a system whereby we tried to immobilize a negative control, the histag, sorry, that is blob, the negative control histag protein that we immobilized in channel one is, is histreptavidin. And then the analyte is anti-spike protein antibodies, and then a ligand, which is SARS-CoV-2, and it's of course histag. We find out that the injection of the histag streptavidin, which doesn't interfere between the interaction between the analyte and ligand, resulted in significant reduction in the channel one response. So actually, uh, surface referencing works. Um, now, what about the other ways that we could control this NSB on the NTA sensor? Similar to what we discussed for the carboxyl sensor, we know that the pH should be taken very seriously, salt, surfactant, and blocker molecules. What do these do? As we, we just uh, learned or we revised, pH doesn't only would stabilize the ligand on the surface because we want to work at slightly basic pHs. That is not the only job. We know that some of the, these NSB could be electrostatic NSB, hydrophobic, and all other, and the protein, protein NSB. And if you have a pH, because it regulates the overall charges of molecules in solution, you would also be able to decrease electrostatic um, NSB. What about salts? Salts, again, work similar to how we see charge shielding effect in size exclusion chromatography. Why is it that your biomolecule doesn't get stuck and never elute from the pores of the resins? Because you have some salt that is going to shield the biomolecule from directly interacting with the resin beads. The same thing can be applied to SPR. There would be some charged molecule from the sodium chloride that would shield the analyte from these sticky uh, uh, surfaces of the sensor. Again, if you have a combination, like we saw last time, a combination of uh, blocker molecules and surfactant like BSA and twin, sufficiently reduce NSV on a carboxyl sensor, 
it works the same way here too. Again, whatever condition that one de uh, decides to go by would be dependent on the kind of binding system that we choose to study. Maybe pH optimization is just not an option for you. You could use sodium chloride or surfactant or blocking molecules, a combination of it, any of them. You need more details on this, kindly visit webinar number four, where I present side-by-side -side image and results for each type of additive that we study. So what about other buffer components? I'm talking about um, other non-buffer components, sorry. So we have dealt with all the buffer issues, almost all of it. Some of them I may have not covered here. But then we know that this technique relies so much on the exposure of the polyhistidine tag to be able to have a ligand on the surface at the first place. What if, for some reason, the protein that you are trying to immobilize is not pure enough? So that the lack of purification actually occludes this polyhistidine tag from being exposed to the surface then maybe what you would have to do is that you would have to do an additional step of purification to fairly expose the tag to be able to be immobilized on the surface. The second item is, this does not apply to everyone. Let's say you are lucky enough that both your analyte and your uh, ligand are both his tag. And you find out that it's only upon the ejection of the analyte that you see NSV. What one could do is that you could flip your binding system. Now your previous uh, ligand becomes your analyte. And since the ligand doesn't have any NSB associated with it, when it's flowing as an analyte, you won't have any NSB issues. Again, it works when you have um, polyhistidine tag on both systems. Also, the last item that I would want to uh, um, hint on is the sensor. I mentioned that these NTA sensors could be stripped of the ligand and then reused, and you could even immobilize a totally new uh, polyhistidine um, ligand. However, you would have to remember that each time you immobilize the same amount of ligand, like the previous one that you stripped of, assuming you immobilize 20 microgram per mil, and then you got two, uh, 2,000 RUs. When you strip it and come back again tomorrow to immobilize 20 microgram of the same ligand, we expect that we have to get closer to 2,000 RUs. When uh, we, do, we do this experiment and we don't get even closer, let's say we get about 40% of the RUs, it means that it may be time for you to replace that sensor. It's done its job. It's tired of stripping and, and then re-immobilization. Another thing could also be that the expiry date of your ligand. If you are using it for, sorry, of your sensor, if you are using it for, you only used it for, let's say, one time, and then the ligand is not binding, you know your ligand is sufficiently pure. There's nickel, there's all the conditions, you have done all the things that is supposed to be successful, but you can't get the ligand to immobilize on the surface. What we also suggest is that look at the expiry date on your sensor, which could be found on the sticker in front of the sensor bottle that it came in. If it expired, it may be time for you to uh, replenish your supply and then have a successful experiment. So in summary, I would like to say that unfortunately NSB exists just as we see in all label-free techniques. And the NTA sensor is not an exception. We saw that for the carboxyl sensor, but we are lucky that we have ways to combat it similar to what, uh, and these ways are reference matching. The reference matching will be immobilizing a histag protein that will not interfere with your desired uh, kinetics in channel one. And then buffer optimization, where we talk about additives, pH, and other stuff that you could also use. Also check your sample property, the purification level, and also the sensor properties, whether it has expired or you have overly uh, stripped it, and then it may be time for you to replace it. I would like to transition into the, uh, the third stage of this presentation by recalling this equation that says, the response that we see on our sensogram is equal to specific binding, non-specific binding, and any bulk refractive index. We talked about bulk refractive index last time, and I'm gonna repeat it again. 
But now we know that at the end of doing all these things, we should be able to overcome NSB because we have already discussed these parameters that we are going to use to combat it. So the next item that we are going to discuss will be a bulk contribution. So then bulk effect or DMSO effect or solvent effect occurs when you have a system buffer of X and then the injection of an analyte, which has, a, uh, um, um, sorry, it occurs when you have a system buffer of refractive index X and you inject an analyte that has a refractive index of X minus one. The difference in between these um, two moieties, the run buffer and then the analyte would cause a sharp rise in your sensogram that plateaus and then decrease straight to baseline. So there's no binding at all. These can look really nice, but then there's no association happening here. Remember that you could also have it in the reverse direction, which is negative bulk shift. There's also different shapes that you could see. Please check the webinar number four for other kinds of uh, patterns that could also be attributed to bulk shifts. Like I mentioned, it's due to buffer mismatch. So the, the number one solution is to match your system buffer to your run buffer. So you are going to take an alley code of your run buffer, I mean the buffer from the buffer bottle that is connected to the line, and then use that to run, to, sorry, to, uh, to make your analyte uh, concentration. Sometimes we get these uh, analyte from stock solution which are stabilized by things like glycerol, DMSO. When it happens like that, what you will do is that, let's say after making your stock that you are going to inject, the percentage of glycerol or DMSO in it is like 0.1%. What you could do is that you could add 0.1% DMSO into your run buffer and there wouldn't be any mismatch. However, sometimes you do all these things and you still see these bulk effects. Two other ways that you could control is, is to use the reference margin, uh, reference correction and solvent correction. Reference, uh, um, reference would come from your two channel system, of course, if you have it. And then the solvent correction is done in trace drawer. Um, please visit webinar number two for more details about solvent correction if you are interested in it. So here, now we are at our response equals specific binding. Nice. But then we still can't fit the data for some reason. We don't know what is going on. Maybe we don't even have data at all. At all. What could be happening is that there could be other things that are, is affecting our run, like very noisy base based ground, but, uh, background. What, this means is that it's okay to have some background because we have buffers and all these things running in our system. But then the intensity of these RU shouldn't be greater than 100 RU. Whenever you have a noise level that is closer to this or greater than this, it means that maybe the reference that you collected from the beginning of your experiment was co collected uh, wrongly. So go back and recollect your um, reference data. Check webinar number four for details about which kind of sense, uh, chip that is used for collection of these uh, references. And because we say that you only collect the reference with a blank chip. The second item that we should look for is buffer blank peaks. What do I mean by buffer blank peaks? It's a good practice to inject some buffer during your analyte injections because you want to know that the, uh, the signals that you are seeing is only attributed to the analyte. It's just the analyte binding to your immobilized ligand. What if you injected a buffer and the buffer gave a similar signal? Then it tells you that somehow there is a residual of this analyte in solution that is sticking around the tubing that needs to be cleaned. So then one would have to do instrument clean. All our instrument cleaning protocol is built into the instrument and the choice will be dependent on the extent of contamination or the kind of buffer system that one is using. So with this, I would like to say that unusual sensogram is bound to be observed because we are dealing with uh, these uh, label free biomolecular techniques but then we always could find ways to control them. 
by using experimental conditions such as our buffer, our sample purity, pH, additives to regulate it, just like we saw on the carboxyl sensors. We also need to correct if we see what I just discussed on the previous um, slide, it, it may be time for us to uh, install a new sensor. And also in terms of the sensors to sometimes check for the expiry date to see that it's still in good shape. And I cannot end by saying that please, please, please perform routine instrument cleaning. That will not only save you money or give you the data that you deserve, it will just give you a peace of mind. If I still haven't covered what you would want, please feel free to contact us at our support page. And also don't forget to check out our new portal where you can find several articles that would cover almost all the things that we have discussed. Still want to ask to discuss other chemistry? Let us know in the comment section. So with this, I will end and welcome your questions. Thank you. Any questions? Are there anything that needs clarification on? Or is it that it's so good that we don't need any clarification? I'm going to give it a couple of minutes and then we will see what comes in. see that. Uh, gosh. Uh, looks like my chat is not showing. I'm sorry, I'm having some difficulties here. Uh, okay, let me give, give me a minute. I'm so sorry. I need to reload this page. Okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm freezing up here. I can't see the chat. Okay, give me one minute, please. Okay. I'm so, so sorry. I'm going to try opening it up on my phone and see. Okay, where is it?
I'm so sorry. I, I can't see. The, oh, yeah. Finally. Okay. Can another cut iron? Yes, 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 yes. Robert, I'm so sorry. It took me a while to, to actually get to this page. I was having some technical difficulties. Yes, of course, you could use cobalt. And, and then research has also shown that since you are able to actually oxidize cobalt 2 to cobalt 3, the oxidation state with cobalt 3 would actually lock your um, your ligand onto the surface, whereby it's not susceptible to divalent ion chelation. So cobalt would be an option. But also bear in mind that you would have to do an additional oxidation step after you have um, done, if you would want to actually lock in the ligand onto the surface. I am so sorry, I just got to this. <laughs> Did I answer that question? Yes, 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 cobalt, yeah. You are welcome. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for waiting. I am so sorry again. Okay. Anything else? I'm going to give it one more minute. Remember, we are still available. We are still open on phone call. We, we can pick up your phone call, emails. Just feel free to visit our support portal and then if you still have more questions, connect with us. Thank you for staying. And we will come back again with another sense of chemistry. Bye for now.